Okay. And with this, the recording is on and uh, welcome everybody to yet another wonderful GW Center for Integrative Medicine, as well as acute on chronic um, open virtual open house. Um, today, we're going to talk about what is CBG. And um, I have a wonderful pleasure of having Abraham and Rebecca with me. And um, um, those of you who've been to this before already know who Abraham is. He's one of our uh, cannabis coaches, but he's also a physician and uh, he's uh, um, working with us right now, which is wonderful. And uh, Rebecca is uh, head of the acute on care program and she's a nurse and there's a nurse practitioner, right? Uh, no, nurse, but I am getting my doctorate and I am going to be uh, a nurse practitioner in about a year or so. <laughs> and she's setting a program where uh, they offer uh, mostly virtual, but also some in-person consults for basically the entire country on cannabis, uh, not just coaching, but also recommendations more in line with how I recommend. And Rebecca and I actually met in Israel. We didn't know each other here in the US. <laughs> yeah. We decided that we're going to collaborate. So that's our brief introduction to who we are. Um, I think all three of us are, did we lose Abraham? Oh, well, I hope he comes back. Um, so all three of us are experts in this topic, and um, we are going to start. Uh, well, we can't start without Abraham, so I hope he comes back. Um, I, I'm still on the call. Oh, okay. So let me do this. <laughs> I'm going to pin both of you guys so we don't have this problem again. Um, all right, I'm going to do the multi-pinning here. Add pin, and then, oh, there you are. Add pin. Yes. Okay. <laughs> now we should be... Um, I'm going to add pin to myself. All right. So everybody should see three of us on top. Um, so I'm going to quickly introduce this topic, and then I'm going to head, hand this over to first Abraham and then uh, Rebecca. I Don't stick around to the end, people. If you want to have some uh, free products, stick around to the end, because only the people who's going to stay to the end are going to have a chance of... Uh, getting one of our sponsors' products uh, ruffled for you. Recording in progress. Uh, all right, and when you're joining, please mute yourself. We don't have a system set up so that everybody gets automatically muted because you can unmute yourself if you absolutely have to ask us something. But I think let's stick with the timeline and uh, we'll have plenty of time for questions. So the reason we decided to cover this topic, three of us, is that we feel that this is one of the newer cannabinoids with a very little amount of evidence out there. Uh, and yet it's now used quite a lot. Uh, you can find it online and also in, the, in physical stores around the country. I've had lots of my patients asking me, what is this? And uh, because finding information on this is not so simple, we've decided to cover this topic. And also, I think it's a very fascinating uh, exogenous cannabinoid. It has some very unique features that you're going to hear from us about today. Um, and with that, without further ado, I'll pass it on to Abraham. And since I'm driving the slides, we'll see how that works. So Abraham, take it away. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kogan. It's great to be here with everyone this morning. Um, I'm just a little more introduction. My name is Dr. Abraham Benavides. Uh, I'm an alum of GW Medicine, class of 2019. I'm a former student of Dr. Kogan, and he's uh, still a mentor to me. Um, I've been working in the uh, cannabis industry as a freelancer since graduation three years ago. Uh, I'm a cannabis health coach for GW CIM and a cannabis coach at Bear Hill. I do literature reviews, writing, scientific advising, uh, and editing for several cannabis companies around the world, in the U.S., the U.K., and Canada. And uh, I'm I'm here today to present the uh, overview of the literature, and I've selected some relevant and recent reviews. Uh, I'm also a COVID long hauler, and so speaking for a prolonged amount of time sometimes gives me some shortness of breath. So 
if you hear that, uh, that's uh, I apologize. Okay, well, let's start. So I always like to get started with kind of like a big picture of whatever topic it is I'm looking at. And so hopefully um, this figure helps, you know, map out where the cannabinoids are that we're going to talk about. And I'd actually like to spend a few minutes talking about uh, cannabigerolic acid or CBGA. Um, its name comes from the synthesis from geronyl pyrophosphate and olive tolic acid. CBGA, as you see here, is the parent cannabinoid for most of our favorite major and minor cannabinoids, including CBG. Um, when I say major cannabinoids, those are typically delta-9 THC and CBD, which are so far the most well-known and well-studied. Minor cannabinoids aren't uh, minor because they have lesser effects, but it's because they're found in relatively small amounts. So for example, CBG is found somewhere on the order of 1%. So basically minor just means rare. CBGA is uncommonly found because most of it is converted into other cannabinoids unless it's harvested very early. Thus, less is known about it. Um, but preclinical research shows that CBGA could possibly play a role in controlling type 2 diabetes and its associated cardiovascular complications. Um, it, it can target PPARs to improve lipid metabolism and reduce the accumulation of adipose tissue, thus reducing insulin resistance in the type 2 patient. Um, it can also inhibit aldolase reductase, which uh, may improve cardiac glucose metabolism and reduce the risk of ACS or acute coronary syndrome. Uh, CBGA also has cytotoxic effect in vitro against uh, colon cancer cells and human leukemia cell lines in lab dishes. These anti-cancer effects were enhanced with the addition of THCA and CBD, respectively. Okay, uh, another interesting study I just want to touch on is that earlier this year, a study in the Journal of Natural Products showed that CBGA and CBDA prevented the entry of SARS-CoV-2 virus into human epithelial cells, and it averted the infection uh, induced by a pseudovirus expressing the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. Um, the researchers found that CBGA and CBDA were similarly effective against both alpha and beta variants of SARS-CoV-2. Um, other research into cannabis terpenes and SARS-CoV-2 have shown some antiviral and anti-inflammatory effects by binding at several relevant target sites. Um, so for example, limonene and citronellol, which are found in geranium and lemon essential oils can downregulate ACE2 expression. And in silico studies of alpha-pinene, alpha-terpinol and caryophylline oxide also suggest multiple viral binding sites. Um, of course, much more research needs to be done in all of these respects. And um, as a follow-up to this study, Dr. Kogan, some colleagues and I are currently publishing a CBDA survey study um, with some encouraging results. And so after it goes through a peer review process, we can, we can update you on publication later. Okay, um, so now we finally get to what is CBG. So CBG is short for cannabigerol. Uh, it is made by non-enzymatic decarboxylation of CBGA, which means that it takes heat exposure to turn CBGA into CBG. It's also a non-psychoactive cannabinoid. Uh, and this presents clinical advantages to more populations. Um, so for example, you know, children, the elderly and other sensitive people who you know, desire not to have psychoactive effects. Um, in the endocannabinoid system, or ECS for short, CBG has a low affinity for cannabinoids CB1 and CB2 receptors, um, but it also inhibits anandamide reuptake. Um, so it boosts these levels of endocannabinoids and thus influences endocannabinoid tone. Okay, um, there are also a large number of non-endocannabinoid system targets of CBG. Uh, CBG activates a large number of TRIP family receptors, including the vanilloid types one through four, TRIP M8, and TRIP A1 channels. It also has the ability to potently activate the alpha-2 adrenergic receptor and moderately block the serotonin receptor. CBG, along with acidic cannabinoids, THCA and CBDA, also binds to and activates PPAR gamma. 
It can also target COX-1 COX and COX-2 enzymes. Okay, so what does all of this uh, receptor binding amount to? Basically, it means that CBG exhibits a wide range of biological activities, including anti-inflammatory, analgesic, antibacterial, and antifungal activities. Also, the regulation of redox balance and neuromodulatory effects. Um, it also has antiproliferative and anti-glaucoma actions. CBG is the one cannabinoid even more effective in slowing cancer cell lines than cannabichromine, or CBC. It has observed anti-cancer effects in breast, prostate, colorectal cancers, and gastric adenocarcinomas, um, thought to be through its TRIP receptor actions. There is both uh, anecdotal human evidence and preclinical animal evidence that CBG may help with IBD conditions. So those are things like Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, and that may be through uh, reducing intestinal inflammation and oxidative stress. Uh, animal models of Huntington's disease and MS uh, have shown some protective effects for neurons, which also raises the potential for CBG to possibly similarly help with the Alzheimer's. CBG is also a non-psychoactive appetite stimulator, which may be of use to patients with cancer and AIDS-related anorexia and cachexia. Such appetite effects are stronger when using whole plant medicine than isolated CBG. Uh, notably, it may antagonize the anti-nausea effects of CBD. Um, in any case, much more human study is needed in all of these regards. Okay, and then I also wanna to touch on this survey um, that was done by Dr. E.B. Russo and team. This is uh, the first patient survey of CBG dominant cannabis products um, to date. It is also the first to document the self-reported efficacy of CBG dominant products, particularly for anxiety, chronic pain, depression, and insomnia. The efficacy overall was really highly rated with the majority reporting their conditions were either very much improved or much improved by CBG. Um, almost 75% claim superiority of these products over conventional medicines for chronic pain, 80% um, for, for depression, 73% for insomnia, and 78.3% for anxiety. Uh, there were 44% of these CBG dominant um, users that reported no adverse effects. Uh, but for those that did, they noted things like dry mouth, sleepiness, increased appetite, and dry eyes. Only two respondents reported withdrawal symptoms, and these were endorsed as sleep difficulties. Okay, um, so where do you find CBG? The highest contents of CBG within a single plant are found in the flowers and leaves of inflorescences that are collected from the highest parts of the plant. Um, there they have approximately 10 times higher CBG content than in the case of fan leaves. And you're gonna wanna select a type four chemovar, uh, which are CBG dominant, uh, also with some CBD present. Um, new, there are new CBG dominant products available on the market um, that are made through careful extraction techniques. And uh, I, I presume we'll hear, hear more about them later from um, our colleagues and our sponsors. So yeah, uh, and then the next slide is just my references. Thank you, Abraham, so much. So and now we, Rebecca and I are gonna cover a bit more of our actual practical use of what we're seeing in our practices, um, as well as kind of repeat some of what Abraham said in a bit more of a direct practical application. So with that, I'll move to the next slide. And Rebecca, I think you're unmuted, so. 
Yeah. So hi, everyone. Uh, again, I'm Rebecca Abraham. I am the founder and CEO of Acute on Chronic. So what we are, uh, we are a um, nursing based clinic. We do have physician advisors um, and we work with medical doctors that provide medical cards in multiple states. Um, but a majority of what we do is education um, and bridging that gap between traditional healthcare uh, and then the cannabis industry, because there's very little communication. And we use the nursing process and a nursing care plan um, to provide patients with um, relief because cannabis care is not, um, you know, no, it's not one size fits all. So we make an individualized care plan. And in those care plans, we often have been using CBG. Um, I'm also a doctoral student at Northern Illinois University, and this is my focus. So um, what have we been seeing? We've actually been seeing a lot of really impressive things when we introduce CBG. It's actually one of the first things we recommend after actually CBD or CBDA, especially in a population that's very scared of THC or maybe folks that are nervous about stigma um, or perhaps even folks that cannot use THC because they work for the Department of Transportation or federal government. So what have we seen? Um, many impressive things. So we've seen a neuropathic pain reduction um, in folks that have numbness, tingling, any kind of electrical pain. We see a reduction in that type of pain um, and a big reduction too. Um, same thing with pain reduction and non-malignant chronic pain. Folks who's come to us um, 20 years of pain of an unknown cause, when they use CBG in higher doses, um, typically between 40 and 80, we do see a significant reduction. So somebody will go from a 10 out of 10 pain to a two to a one out of 10 pain. Um, oncology and our older frail um, adult patients um, report increased in appetite, um, even without the use of THC. We published a, post, a poster for the Society of General and Internal Medicine uh, where we used a significant amount of CBG and we actually showed um, complete symptom relief now going on a year of restless leg syndrome, which is something very difficult oftentimes in traditional medicine to treat. We see a pretty significant decrease in anxiety and agitation in older adults with symptoms of dementia. And this is not only in the home setting. Um, we've been fortunate enough where some nursing facilities um, and SNFs have allowed us to work with their patients and have allowed patients to receive cannabis products in the facility. And even in facility with people who were sundowning and people with pretty severe um, dementia, we are seeing them calmer. Um, we are seeing less less OCD tendencies, less agitation throughout the day, and then less sleepiness throughout the day, and then less agitation at night. So it's really, really impressive stuff. Um, and then um, possible memory benefit in patients with mild cognitive impairment. So I'll let Dr. Kogan talk about that note, but, um, and this is pretty consistent. Um, so of course more research is needed, um, but we track these things, what uh, cannabinoid is working for which patients. And the biggest thing I'm seeing is uh, chronic pain, either neuropathic, apathic or inflammatory, and then the decreased anxiety and agitation and dementia. So Rebecca, let's let's talk a little bit about back and forth, all three of us. Yeah. Uh, I think this is where everybody, of course, wants to hear more. Um, so, okay, let let me ask you first question. And by the way, if participants have questions, I think it's actually we can even start right here. So just drop them in the box, don't in the chat, don't unmute yourself yet. We're just going to try to kind of incorporate the questions. But I, I'm going to start with this. So you know, of course, there's a lot of overlap, right? So the CBDA has a lot of pain reducing benefits. A lot of people tell us, even though the evidence is limited, that CBD can be very helpful for pain. So how would you, both of you guys, how would you um, kind of strat strategize here? Like who should get CBD versus CBG? Who should be getting CBDA versus CBD plus CBG? Or I mean, what are the, what are the pathways of the thought process here? Let's start with this. So I can go first. So typically what we do um, in our work is we do do a full, pretty robust nursing assessment. If it's on Zoom, we get all the information we can. If in person, we even do a physical examination. And part of where we pick CBD, CBDA, or CBG is based off of that assessment. We also collaborate with a lot of physicians. Um, I just talked to a palliative physician last week where um, a particular patient was in a trial and CBD was contraindicated. So that is a person where I asked um, the PI of the study, 
are you okay with CBG? There's very little research. We don't truly know what it does, but so far what we're seeing is CBD in the research seems to interact more than CBG as long as it's not, and we'll talk about this, as long as it's not like a psychiatric medication. Um, and they were like, yes, try it. Um, that's fine. So that's one indication is when we say CBD contraindicated, we oftentimes ask the physician, are you okay with trying this? It may not interact, um, but it, it works pretty well and it's not psychoactive. Um, whenever I hear anybody has any kind of neuro, neuropathic, neurological related process, um, that's the other time when we really give it a go because we just, you know, we see results. Unfortunately, there's no um, very strong randomized control trials regarding this, but um, we do look back at patient data to see what works. So that's when we, we pull it out again. And, and the way we do our work is, um, and I think all three of us on the panel can speak to this, is um, cannabis care is a little more complicated than the industry really wants people to think. The endocannabinoid system is very complicated. So we do oftentimes recommend to our patients um, that oftentimes they may use more than one cannabinoid in their care to have complete results or um, to have more effective results at lower dosing you know, in the literature, in real life, we do see people using one cannabinoid, you know, if they take a lot of it, they get symptom relief. But we often see um, when we combine many cannabinoids, folks often use, need to use uh, less amounts. So that's how we kind of make the decision. Great, great. Abram, you want to add anything to this? Um, that was really excellent. There's not much to add. Um, if I were to add something, I would say that it also kind of depends on what kind of access that our patients have. So if they have access to a dispensary or not, um, because if they do have access to a dispensary, it would be very easy, especially CBDA products, because, you know, those are typically coming from the other cannabinoids are more regularly harvested. And so it just might be harder to find CBG products. Um, but if people um, are willing to look online, they, they could definitely find it. Uh, but otherwise, the rest of that was, was really great. Oh, thank you. I do want to add one thing to all of you guys. I tend to find that the particularly patients who have a combination of anxiety and depression benefit from CBG a lot more than from CBD or any other cannabinoids, maybe with exception of low dose THC. Sometimes that also becomes really important. Uh, but there's some kind of a very unusual effect because, you know, from, we think of CBD more as a pretty strong anti-anxiolytic. Uh, so if you give it too much, some patients actually literally would say, I feel a little depressed. I wouldn't say it will cause depression, but they do feel a little blue and they definitely could feel a little sleepy. We don't really see a lot of that with CBG. I initially thought that actually CBG is going to be activating because there was some data on that, but it, it doesn't do that either. So I've uh, early on in the first year of use, I think I've I think it was telling patients not to take it too late, right? But turns out, that's, turns out that's usually not a problem and usually the opposite. Some patients actually feel sleeping better on it, not worse. So, well, that's great. Um, I, before we have, there's some chat questions, but I have a one particular personal question here because I have not seen this. Rebecca, with RLS, uh, so this is uh, um, basically restless leg syndrome. People jerk legs at night. Uh, they may have a hard time falling asleep. Their partners may have even big, bigger problem with this than the patients. So how are you using this? Are you, are you, is it under the tongue topically? Like what, what, what are you applying? For the particular patient um, that we did our case study and poster presentation on. And so this is a pretty remarkable story. It was impressive six months ago and it, it remains impressive because we keep in contact with them. Mm -hmm. um, it has since been almost a year. Um, it took about five weeks um, for our cannabis care plan to begin working. So she had very little to no relief. Um, when she first started working with us, it took about five weeks and five appointments, if not more, um, to begin getting relief. And then one day she woke up and it was gone. Um, she remains completely symptom-free um, after, you know, decades of this disease process. Um, she is still pain-free. And then we saw other clinical numbers change. She is now no longer hypertensive and she had diabetes type two that has since resolved. Um, you know, she's not on any um, oral agents at all. So it's really impressive. So how did, how did we uh, make this happen for her with CBG? Um, we used a vaporizer. Um, there is a, a 
vape pen that's available here in Illinois um, that is extracted with CO2 extraction. And it's one of the few that actually um, has frozen terpenes added back in. So it has beta carophylline, um, I believe a little bit of lemonine to it as well. And of course, myrcene because um, for another talk on another day, most of cannabis products in the United States all have myrcene and it. it's hard to get away from it. Um, this particular vape also had a percentage of CBG, THC and CBD. So we had her inhale that um, as needed and then we gave it in the edible form. So we actually recommended um, THC and CBG gummies that were about five milligrams. I think her total dose ended up being about 15 milligrams about twice a day. And yeah, um, we used a little low dose. Day. Yeah, it's not a high dose by any stretch. Not at all. So the which also important because it, it brings the cost a lot down too. Because of course this is all out of pocket. Wonderful. Um, I think let's do this. Two questions that are currently in the chat. Uh, the first question is dose related. The second is more about combination, which is great because then we'll transition to the side effects and interactions. So, um, so Jane is asking um, about dosage and timing uh, for CBG and CBGA. Let me take the CBGA question first, um, because that's well, actually maybe Rebecca, maybe you even have more experience because I have very limited experience with CBGA. I think that's the newest product that just came out, I would say no more than six months ago. Um, so I don't think, we know, how, I mean, their dosing sense, I mean, we know what we can obtain, but I mean, how to dose it, I don't know. But, but probably I have a lot more experience with CBDA and we had a whole presentation on that. Uh, but uh, so yeah, Rebecca, why don't you take the first hit? I think you're more- Yeah, excited. I actually have very limited um, experience with CBGA because it's also difficult for us to find over here in the Midwest. Um, I do know a company that's starting to make it. I'm excited uh, to use it because um, you know, just like we saw with CBDA, you kind of see even more potential than CBD had. Um, that was my experience with CBDA. So I'm hoping and assuming that the CBGA with the acid attached will be similar. But yeah, and then as far as dosing and timing of dosing go, the way we do this is we tell patients in that first initial meeting when they get their care plan, they always ask about timing. And the literature doesn't really say what the timing should be. So we start off with what works best for them and their schedule. Um, you know, oftentimes in nursing and medicine, we don't give antibiotics three times a day because it's hard for people to take something three times a day. Um, so I always tell them what works for you, works for me, and then we'll adjust later depending on your symptoms and side effects. And then dosing, um, lit review and what they've tried before is typically, um, what we use, but it's it's really different for everyone. So um, in that RLS patient, you know, it was very little CBG, um, no more than 50 milligrams. However, um, I have a couple of patients that take 80 milligrams a day to 60 milligrams a day, so. Yeah, I'm gonna add that I think most of my patients in some kind of combination, I would say, I, I think what Rebecca said a little bit earlier that we, we I think universally seeing that when you combine different exogenous cannabinoids, we're seeing a decrease in doses needed. Um, I think that's very universally true, not just with THC, it's true for others, for CBD, for CBDA, et cetera. And so I agree with that. So I often start with the mixes. And when we talk about particular products, I'll show you some of what I often use. So I often combine CBD and CBG at the same time, especially if the, one of the key aspects of treatment is anxiety. I find that that particular indication uh, it just causes less sedation. Uh, sometimes CBD dose for anxiety needs to be pretty high, and I kind of like not to get there if <clears throat> lower dose of a mix works better. Uh, that's the things that I want to add. Abraham, do you have anything to you want to add to this question? Yeah. Uh, so I think the goal <clears throat> for my patients, and I'm sure for you guys too, is always to find the smallest possible dose that's going to give you the most benefit with the least side effects. And so I'm a big fan of ramping up um, or, you know, a tapering plan. So um, I, I would say that until better data comes out about pharmacokinetics of these cannabinoids, I'm probably going to assume they're roughly the same as CBD. Um, and so, and, and I probably want to keep the ratios really similar. Um, and so, you know, having things to be 
one to one to one. Um, if that looks good, then I think that's probably a good place to go. But I would generally start start low and ramp up maybe you know every week or so is usually what I do. Exactly. Exactly. That's great. And I also want to echo what Rebecca said earlier. We all of us are very fascinated with acidic forms. So that's CBDA, CBGA. And uh, it, it feels like that those require lower doses. That's one of the biggest advantages. And, and, they, so, and they're probably a bit more potent. I also want to mention one other thing of CBG. So CBG has this COX-1, 2, more 2 than 1 inhibition, at least in theory. And that's why we think some of the pain has inflammatory pain is, is beneficial. So we, we yet to see, but it's possible that CBGA like CBDA is gonna have even more potency there. So just a little edit. So um, there's two other questions there now. I think let's do this. I think let's finish uh, the next couple of slides and then come back to the questions. Because first of all, the next slide, oh, I, I'm, I'm struggling here with two screens. Oops, sorry. Okay, there we go. So uh, I think there was a question about side effects. So I, I won't address that first. Um, so those of you, you can just take a look at the screen. There's actually very, very, very limited data on side effects. I, uh, Rebecca, I've only seen one case of side effect of the person developing this kind of a nausea, dizziness, vertigo at the dose of 40 milligrams. And we had to cut the dose in half and that worked. And you've seen more than one case, right? Yeah. Um, in two people, what happened was, and this is only in the very high doses, and the high doses were working up to a point. Um, these doses were um, RSO. It was a CBG THC. And then the other um, was just the straight um, hemp-based CBG. So what happened is in these higher doses, 80 to 100 milligrams, um, the patient's pain was resolved. And um, this is a case where we did not know the cause of the pain. The patient did not know the cause of the pain. Um, and we saw the pain relief happen in two parts. We saw initial relief in the beginning, about four to six weeks in, where they went from a 10 out of 10 pain to a five out of 10 pain. And then a couple of months later, mostly using just THC, CBG, and CBDA, the little bit of THCA, um, they called me nine months later, um, 10 months later, and said, I am now a two out of 10 pain. Um, he was doing hobbies again, interacting, more activity, really fantastic stuff. Uh, all of a sudden, we noted dizziness and nausea. Wasn't sure where it was coming from. Um, I did find in Canakees, it's this database we all use um, for where all of the cannabis studies are compiled, making it easier, um, where there was nausea noted. I can't remember if it was a case study, but I saw it and I was like, hmm, I wonder if this is it. So I had um, this patient turn down the CBG just a little bit, the hemp-based CBD. Nausea, dizziness, completely resolved. Very similar case with the other person high doses, two part, um, two kind of waves of pain reduction. And then suddenly after a couple of weeks of use, still two out of 10 pain, one out of 10 pain, but noted dizziness, nausea, when we turned down the CBG, same thing happened. Yeah, so the, there's a seemingly a repetitive theme here. So I'm, I'm wondering if the, the CBG is very potent uh, immunoprotect, uh, neuroprotectant, I mean, I think. Uh, I will hold telling you what I'm observing with the, with the Alzheimer's simply because the numbers are small and I need to, before I say anything, I have to be careful here. And, but I will tell you one thing, that, that, that it has to be a complex mix and it has to be complex with, with, with a very specific terpenes at, the, at the pretty high percentages. So as, uh, basically as high as tolerable, uh, pinene and a few others. Um, so... But there, it may be related to that, but I, I don't think that we actually understand the mechanism. But anything that binds to serotonergic receptors seemingly has a potential for inducing side effects of nausea and dizziness and uh, just sort of kind of the vertigo states. So, um, so maybe that's what it is. But again, I, I think I'm speculating. Okay, and then um, we don't have enough information, but there may be interaction. So I, I think I'm gonna emphasize the word maybe. Right, Rebecca, I, I don't right. think that, you know, we have not, I have not seen anything in clinical practice. I have not seen any single case. Um, we're going to task Abraham 
as being the youngest in our crowd to try to find the case of interactions for this, but it's probably going to fail and that would be good. But I mean, I, I think part of it is just, there's just not enough experience. We, if there are going to be interactions, we're going to see them. It, it reminds me a little bit of story early of CBD. I, I think we've been quite early cautious and we do know there's very strong interactions with cytochrome P450 subcategories of enzymes, uh, at least one and possibly more than one. And, and the reality is we're not really seeing all of that much in clinical practice. So it's hard to say whether those interactions have to happen with very high oral doses. Uh, Rebecca mentioned inhaled form. I think most of us use sublingual forms where a much lower dose gets swallowed. So you end up with most of the absorption under the tongue and a tiny fraction of that ends up in the liver. So that decreases chance of interaction quite significantly. But even with oral forms like epidiolex, which is a pure CBD pharmaceutical grade, they're not really seeing all that much, which is encouraging. So I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, yeah, I agree. I've been, so our nurses and physicians, we watch people like hawks um, to the point of we let the patients and physicians know about every potential interaction that could happen. And we just haven't seen anything. We tell people to like take notes. If anything changes anything at all, let us know. Um, what we have seen with CBG, um, and you both have probably seen this too with THC and CBD and CBDA is oftentimes we see people who are using a lot of polypharmacy, you start cannabis care and if you do see a drug interaction, it's often more synergistic than harmful. And it's neat to kind of see on the PCP side or the physician side that they can then, they kind of start testing the waters with decreasing pharmaceuticals. Um, that's really the only thing I've seen is, is more synergistic than I have never seen any um, really no side effects at this point. So, or interaction, side effects from interactions, I should say. So I think with that, uh, um, Chain had a great question about uh, combining CBG for neurological conditions with the traditional pharmaceuticals. And um, you know, what do we know of the interactions with CBG with those medications? So uh, again, we kind of just covered that. We don't really know. We don't have a really good grip on this. Um, I think we're always extremely cautious combining different things, especially in cases of patients with a neurodegenerative conditions, there's often a lot of interactions between different medications and foods and, and supplements. I, we haven't seen anything. Um, I think it's encouraging, but of course we're gonna be careful now. There are some of these minor uh, symptoms or side effects, which we've caught and treated very quickly and successfully without any com further complications. Uh, will we see more complex cases in the future? Probably. Um, most of the patients I'm treating, and I'm sure, um, well, Abraham and Rebecca is the same, come to us if they have a complex neurologic disease, they're going to be on multiple cocktail of medications. And we're kind of used to combining cannabinoids with that. Um, and historically, there's not a lot of interactions. And usually what happens if the patients are having a significant benefit very quickly, we just taper the meds off. I can give you some basic examples. Um, with Parkinson's, I have seen decrease in dose of Parkinson medications on a rapid scale. We're talking about days or even hours. I have seen that. That's more with, with THC, not, not, not really with CBG. I don't think I've had enough experience with CBG for Parkinson's yet. Um, so, you know, it definitely can be done. It's even more uh, impressive with um, benzodiazepines uh, that are used quite often in patients with neurologic, especially with Parkinson's for sleep disorders, because Parkinson's causes very frequently sleep, sleep disturbances. I would say at least 50% of cases we can get people off of the benzodiazepines within a few months. That takes time because that has to be done slowly. Um, so it's not really, there is probably interaction, but it's beneficial for us because we're benefiting the underlying symptom and so the medication need goes down and we taper it off so i'll have you guys add whatever you feel like adding to this yeah um the one particular medication where i have seen a need um to decrease is mirtazapine um i have noted patients with more daytime sleepiness um and that's when you know we kind of looked into it it's a side effect of mirtazapine and when the mirtazapine was decreased 
sleepiness went away, patient was still doing well. So, yeah. Um, so that makes a lot of sense because mirtazapin is an antidepressant that's used very frequently in older adults as a kind of a mild sedative. Mm -hmm. I would say it's not so mild, especially at higher doses. It's actually quite sedating and and. I tend to, I'm not a huge fan of this medication, but I yeah. do use it occasionally. So yeah, that's exactly. So that makes a lot of sense. I wonder if we're going to see the same with other antidepressants in the future that have some more of a downing effects. So maybe not Zoloft, but more like uh, uh, Lexapro or similar. Uh, yeah, Lexapro. Yeah. And Abraham, and if you guys seeing a little background noise, I apologize. I'm at home today with the two teenagers going out of their wits before the school starts. So ah. apologies. Um, yeah, Rebecca brings up a great point. And I think that in general, we should be cautious of medications that are more sedating um, and just keep an eye on how um, these interactions go because um, they could be synergistic or they could be detrimental and, and putting your, your patients at more risk. So I would say um, just use more caution in people with something that's already you know, uh, like CNS depressing or, or sedating like that. Um, like like if they're on benzos, for example, um, or opiates. Um, not that it's necessarily unsafe, but um, you know, these things are also dose dependent, right? And so it's not that you can't use it at all. Um, you know, like in med school, they say the dose makes the poison. So, um, you know, you, you, can always, you can always cut back down. All right, so let's review one more time the benefits. Um, I'll let Rebecca walk us through this slide. Yeah, so um, I went to a couple lectures on CBG because I was um, pretty interested in more information. Um, so in some of the literature, um, there has been shown, and this is you know preclinical data, but glaucoma, um, there has been a noted decrease of interocular pressure and no ocular toxicity and notes of neuroprotectiveness. And these are kind of the things we are finding, you know, as the literature grows globally, um, more and more a case for neuroprotectiveness. Um, we have given um, some glaucoma patients, CBG, and, um, you know, glaucoma is kind of the first thing people think of with cannabis care, right? It's one of the things how cannabis first was used as a medicinal product um, was in 1978. Um, THC typically decreases interocular pressure. CBD can increase it, but CBG seems to also decrease it. So really great for folks um, with glaucoma. You could pair THC and, and uh, CBG and have um, fairly good results. Um, and we have some patient data that reflects that. Um, Anti-anxiety and relaxation, um, it, again, in some of the preclinical literature when they're exploring the endocannabinoid system and how these different cannabinoids works, um, there's no very few studies on CBG alone. There are studies studies um, where they kind of review many cannabinoids. And so it seems like CBG downregulates the sympathetic nervous system if you're on this and you are not in medicine. So what's that? Um, that's your fight or flight. Um, increasing your sympathetic nervous system is not the best for us. Um, long term, it can cause a lot of cardiac problems, hypertension, and so on. When you downregulate that, um, it's more relaxing. Um, you're very chill. So that might be why we're seeing an anti-anxiety and anti-agitation effect. Um, and then pain relief can't be understated at all. Um, Anti-inflammatory properties. And then, um, especially with the neuropathic pain, we don't know why at all. Um, with inflammatory, seems like the COX-1 and COX-2 inhibitors um, seems like it may in, um, inhibit PEA. So PEA is this kind of new, it's not new. Um, it's a it's, a, a, I believe, a fatty acid um, that you can now buy, um, but it also works on our endocannabinoid system and it, in, it increases anti-inflammatory effects, plus reduced prostaglandin um, synthesis. And there's also a thought that part of why cannabis in particular CBG works with neuropathic pain is it changes that cell messaging. You know, when we have pain, it tells our brain, hey, we're in pain chronic pain, um, a little more of a neuropsychiatric disorder because they're not sure why chronic pain exists. So changing the messaging for some folks can be really important, but um, the pain relief has, has been really impressive to see. And then there was a really cool study where they saw probably because of the down regulation of the sympathetic nervous system is we see an improvement in metabolic syndrome. So 
um, and perhaps um, weight reduction and a decrease in uh, diabetes type two. So pretty cool, interesting stuff in the literature, but please know that this is, um, there's a lot of preclinical and very individualized case studies or CBGs shoved into a study on all cannabinoids. So um, it would be great to have more studies on this, much like we have you know, more on CBD and THC. I think this is the next cannabinoid we should look to. Great. Um, I'm mindful of time. So I think what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to put the reference slide for Rebecca's slide just yes. so that it's up here for a minute. So because we're recording this and everybody can go back and then replay this so that you can find the references and, and take a note of what you need to take a note of. Um, I think let's do this. Um, I'm going to ask you both a question and myself. Um, and then we're going to, there's two questions in the chat, and then we're going to take at least five more minutes after to see if there's more questions. So those of you who are ready to give us questions, put them in the chat. So my question goes like this. We have all this complexity, right? I mean, there's now more cannabinoids than uh, can fit on one line, right? And now it's going to be a whole page soon. How do, what are you seeing, guys, in terms of the general role of CBG being taken within the scope of the whole field? I know it's a not easy question to answer, but I think that is the critical question that a lot of us are wondering. No particular order. Mm. All right, let me give you my answer. Let me think. So, yeah, let me think. Since I come up with it. Um, I have a feeling that we're going to quickly find that this is going to be one of the most bringing together cannabinoids. So what I mean by that is when we work with plants, uh, you know, I don't know if any of our listeners right now are, are expert in, in, in uh, medical botany, there are these herbs that tend to kind of unify and amplify effect of other cannabinoids. I think CBG is gonna have its own unique properties, but I think it's also gonna serve the role of potentiating of the impact of a whole cocktail. So I have a very strong feeling that we're gonna see the CBG in the future started to be used as the entry point to have a complex cocktails. Most of us right now still have our patients take one, two, but I have a feeling that in the future, we're gonna start seeing a very sophisticated, maybe even compounded, self-compounded for a particular patient, like patient comes and says, I have this, this, and that. And instead of saying, well, why don't you take CBG in the morning, CBD at night, we'll do something like, well, here's your morning product. And it's heavily like specifically orchestrated for you. And here isn't an optimum. Now we're not quite there yet, but I think we're going to be there much sooner than I thought. I thought that this is five years off. I already started to see cannabis compounding pharmacies popping up. So I think we're going to see this a lot sooner. It's my answer. Yeah, I agree. I, I feel like um, I oftentimes say, I think CBG is the new CBD. I think this is what everyone thought CBD was, but I think this is more it. I do think there's a place for CBD. Um, there have where CBG goes wrong, and, and we didn't talk about this because I didn't I didn't have the proper uh, reference. But um, I did once hear in a lecture that in CBG in at least or CBGA went poorly for people with a seizure disorder or epilepsy. CBGA. So that's, that's it. Yeah. Um, so that's a place where like CBD and CBDA absolutely has its place. Um, but I, yeah, I I think it's um, I think it's really the future, and I suspect you know I don't ever think there's going to be any kind of true standardized dosing because botanicals just behave so differently than synthetics. Do I think this should be synthesized? No. <laughs> and I, I think you you guys probably agree. It's, I think yeah, we're, sure. we're a plant-based crowd. We, we, we're not yeah. drug kind of people. <laughs> exactly. Um, so yeah, I think, um, you know, one of the physicians that's going to start working with us is really into also, you know, um, functional medicine and, and botanicals. And yeah, um, there's a place for pharmaceuticals, but I think we should keep the botanicals, the botanicals. And yeah, um, I think, I think this is this is the future, M maybe in isolation, but probably with um, your THC and your your CBDs, depending on your disease process, your medications, and all of that. Yeah, um, I appreciate us mentioning that we are plant based people. That is great, um, and then also coming from the background of you know traditional allopathic medicine, 
Um, I am still a fan of kind of the stepwise approach of, of adding things on, um, you know, I, and I do that also with, with my dosing as well as whether I'm going to add another cannabinoid to someone's regimen or not. I would say that CBG is going to come more into the picture with the things that kind of are uh, a little bit more unique about it. So maybe for patients with like IBD or patient or, you know, more with cancer patients with advanced cachexia anorexia, because those are kind of more specific indications to CBG rather than CBD and CBDA, right? Because the CBD and CBDA can be appetite depressing. And so I think um, for those patients, we'll start probably giving them CBG more often, especially becomes more available um, at your local dispensary or online. Um, and I think from there, hopefully, I, I'm a big literature guy, hopefully we'll see a lot more research and studies being published and we will start incidentally finding other things as cannabis research usually goes. Yeah, <laughs> you know, you that's one thing very that true. Five things pop up that you didn't consider. That, um, that's so, why I think this field is so profound is that we're like, this, we're not even, we're not even at the, we're still at baby steps. We're not even reached the toddler stages yet. We're like yeah. discovering things left and right. You speak to the left and there's discovery there, which I think is exactly right. Absolutely. I could go on and on and on and on and on about this topic, but what I think makes me feel, um, you know, all of us want to sleep at night and we all went into healthcare because we wanted to help people and people are like, well, if there's a lack of data, how can you do this with such certainty? And what gives me peace is, you know, folks have been using this for thousands of years, right? Uh, granted, we don't want to do everything we did a thousand years ago, but we have that historical data. But what we have now um, is, I was going somewhere with this, I swear to God. <laughs> Hold on, let me catch my, my train of thought. Oh, oh I know, I've got it. Um, but you're answering, Rebecca, you're answering Mackenzie's question because it's critical is what do we tell to the, yeah. our patients, other providers? So you're basically just answering that question. Question. So, so we have that historical data. I got it now. I remembered what I was saying. Oh, I forgot it again. No, I have it now. Oh. <laughs> Hold on. Sorry. Come back. I. It's going to come back to me any second now. I got it. It's back. I keep forgetting this fact because I just learned this the other day. So has there been billions of dollars poured into cannabis research? Yes. How much of that has gone to the benefits of therapeutic cannabis? This much. Yeah, like one to five percent. So billions of dollars in research to look for the harms in medical cannabis and they can't find it. Anything. Um, they, anything. The, the, the things that they found actually led to multiple discoveries of benefits. Because right. in the parallel of looking for side effects, they discovered a bunch of things like, oh my God, there was less placebo effect <laughs> than in a placebo group. Well, you have to now discuss this somehow because you can't ignore this. So th th those are the things that I not just completely agree. I think when we talk to the providers in the topic that has very limited data clinically, one thing we have to always emphasize, look, we know the safety super well. These products have been used for a long time. I understand that you have to have a tremendous amount of evidence for something like chemotherapy, but for something that's not like how much truly evidence do you need? And this is where I often bring up the point of N of one. So Mackenzie, and that goes to all of everybody else who's interested. If you took a product, you tolerated it well, and you had a really good response to it, never be afraid to saying, look, this works for me. And the person who recommended it saying, yep, I have seen this before with other patients. That becomes its own valuable clinical evidence that we should never discard as nothing. And unfortunately, the standard of care often does try to discourage us from doing this, but I think that's wrong. So I'm mindful of time. I'm gonna cut us a little short because I still want us to do a raffle, which yeah. is coming up. And we still have to say words about our, our, our um, the products that we're using and also Claudette had the question. So I think I'm gonna take that very conveniently as a last question because it's very practical. So I'm dealing with a potential back pain surgery. How can I convince my doctor that this is a more acceptable route to take? I don't have much info on CBG. You guys take this one. 
so for this, um, this is all I do all day, every day is convincing um, physicians about who are very scared of cannabis. And um, most physicians, um, you know, aren't educated on this. Nurses aren't educated on this and, and we should be. Um, they are scared. Um, stigma, litigation, it terrifies them, DEA license. So what, what do you say? Um, you could hire one of us and we do this work for you because uh, we can speak the language. The other thing is if they're still afraid, if you're like, hey, doctor, you know, I went to this talk. I hear this is a very safe substance. Uh, what say you? And they're like, oh, not enough data. What you can say, and this is what I tell patients, especially when they get scared about these potential side effects when I'm like, watch closely for medication interactions, they get very frightened, right? Watch for low blood pressure, that kind of thing. Um, I compare cannabis side effects of what we know with the billion dollars of research um, compared to something we use common, NSAIDs. So that's your ibuprofen, your Motrin, your Advil. The side effects of that very safe medication is kidney failure, GI bleeds, increased risk of heart attack, stroke, headaches you know, and people take it like it's every nothing. year, two to 500 people die from Motrin and total several thousands of people die from total number of NSAIDs and about 800 people or so die from Tylenol. We get to see a single death directly from cannabis, unless you stupidly run into the pole driving intoxicated. But if you're not, there has never been a case. We've never seen one. And here you have medications that they don't even like they don't even ask you if you want to take it. They just say, well, you're going to take this because my mom, this is what I do. You know, they don't even tell you often that there's actually a risk of very serious complications from all these drugs. And the moment they start hearing something else, they're often like, oh, I don't know. That's not evidence. So exactly. So yeah. I think I'm going to cut us a little short because we have three minutes left. I want to respect everybody's time. So let's give... Uh, a little kind of due diligence to our, this is our brand. So um, Rebecca, you want to say a word about uh, Co Valley Cannabis? I don't know. Yeah. You... So um, this is a company based out of um, Lawrence, Kansas, right outside of Kansas City. I'm going to visit their hemp farm this weekend. And what I liked about them is um, I was walking past a booth at some conference and they showed me their lab results. Um, any company that shoves lab results in your face, that's your company. Um, if people hide their lab results, maybe not. Um, so I have noticed um, significant patient benefits with their products. What's nice is it can go in water, um, smoothies. So especially in older adults who have trouble eating or in their own facility, it's hard to get the nurse or the family to consistently give this, but you could pre-make it into like shakes or insurers or water. So that's what I like about it. Um, they're very nice people. So I'm excited to visit their farm, but yep, good lab reports and that's what matters. And likely I will give them a try as well, because frankly, there's just not that many good brands. So the ones that you see on the right, uh, Miriam's Hemp uh, and then Lily Hill, those are the ones that I tend to use. Uh, why I've used them before. So I, they simply started adding CBG and I kind of just progressed with that. Really no other particular reason to be honest with you. Um, and uh, with that, um, ruffle time. Okay, so the way we're gonna do this is very mystical, but I promise you it's fair. So what we have, we have four products. We're gonna start with the first one. I'm gonna pull up a random generating number on my phone. We have 27 participants. So we're gonna generate the first number and it's 16. So yeah, I know it's a little bizarre, but just give me a second because I have to calculate people from above. And that's how I decided we're gonna do this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Luis Dominguez, congratulations. You're a successful winner of the Miriam's Hemp CBG 600 milligram in one ounce bottle. Before the end of the call, it's very important that you put your contact information, just your email will probably be sufficient into the chat, okay? You can't leave. If you don't do that, we're gonna have to re-raffle your product to somebody else. All right. And let's do the Miriam's Hemp 1200 milligram. All right, so we're going to same number of participants, all right? 
That's 25. So uh, Luis was 16, so 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 24, 25. Vicky Taylor, congratulations. Mm -hmm. You, wait a second. Is that right? Uh, no, that's not right, right? Because there's only, oh, because somebody left. Okay, well then Vicky Taylor remains the <laughs> winner. So Vicky Taylor, you are remaining a winner. Uh, of the 1200 milligram Miriam hemp bottle. So please make sure you put in chat your email address and congratulations. And, and a reminder, Luis, we not, Luis Dominguez, we're not seeing your email, are we? No, right? Okay, well, we'll give you a couple of minutes because we still have Lily Hill products. So Lily Hill, we have a two products. They're one-to-one -one CBD to CBG. And let's raffle the first one. And we now have... 26 participants and that number is four so that means that we have two, three bart bart leonard i think i know who you are and congratulations but please put your email into the chat uh, by the way, both you, Bart and Louis, if you guys cannot, for whatever reason, physically put it in, please don't feel bad. Unmute yourself and tell us your email. And last but not least, and sorry, we're going to go a couple of minutes over. We have the second bottle of Lily Heal CBD, and that will go to number 19. I have to start over here. So... And that is Patrick and Lucy. Patrick and Lucy, you guys, a winner of the one-to-one -one bottle of CBD to CBG. And by the way, if any of you guys are here are sponsors, because you may be, um, and somehow you end up winning your own bottle, I suggest that we uh, redo that. But Patrick and Lucy, please put your email. Bart, we got your email and we got Vicky's email. So we're still waiting for Louis's email. And unfortunately, Louis, um, if you don't respond soon, and same goes with Patrick and Lucy, we're going to have to re ruffle. And we will then re ruffle a Miriam Hemp 600 milligrams and Lily Hill bottle. Da, da, da. One, two, three, four. Well, I feel bad, but that's such as life, right? Uh, so we got Patrick, we got yours. Thank you, Patrick and Lucy. So, okay. So we re ruffling 600 <clears throat> milligrams of, uh, and now we have 24 participants, people are leaving. That's okay. And that is fine. So the 600 milligrams of, CBG from Miriam's hemp goes to Choo Choo. I'm sorry, I will mispronounce this. Uh, Choo Choo, is that okay? So please. Choo Choo on Wachi Saunders. Wonderful, thank you so much. Please put your email, your, your congratulations. You're at the winner of 600 milligram bottle. Of thank you, thank you. Well, with that, I'm gonna keep the meeting on because I have to cut. Oh, Louis, put the email. Oh, yeah. what are we gonna do? Okay, we're gonna figure something out. Both of you guys gonna get a bottle. Don't worry. We'll we'll we'll, we'll make it happen. Um, so we'll we'll have just extra bottles somehow. I, I don't think that we're gonna problem with that. So um, I'm gonna keep the because I have to copy things. Uh, but um, with that, I'm gonna stop sharing. And um, if anybody's still here and you guys have a question or two while I'm doing some admin, by all means. And also, we always ask people at the end, if you have a particular interest in future topics, drop them in the chat because we will be continuing. As you know, we're kind of doing two different things now. We're doing a regular um, cannabis-related topics in the same open house, but we're also doing some more general integrative medicine topics and we'll continue this kind of a split where we're gonna probably alternate. So, and uh, uh, thank you so much, Chuchuan Wawuchi Sanders. I don't know if I said that right, but I'm trying. And um, I'm gonna save chat, so that's done. And we're gonna stay here for a minute or two. Otherwise, everybody have a wonderful uh, weekend and I'm going to stop recording at this point.